And I remembered that when I was a little girl, I'd made a basket. So I went and gathered a few things out of the woods and made a basket. And you thought I was amazing. I thought I thought I was all amazing too to remember it. Anyway, after that, they all wanted to make baskets at school. But I really couldn't remember and I really didn't have any books. So from that little tiny beginning, it started my interest in basketry and I'm also a weaver. And I had a, I've had a very wonderful opportunity to go to various countries to study various things like cedar basketry and I've been to Japan and other things and I went to um, Europe, Scandinavia. So I've had a terrific opportunity to learn and I'm really blessed that I've had this opportunity through the Arts Council. And one of the reasons I think I got that opportunity was I did write books about basketry. And one of the little books I've handed out to, to everybody today, I got a kind of a council card to write this little book because I did feel when I was doing all this sort of investigating that here we were sitting now in the, you know, the new century practically and we were forgetting all the things that we used to use and particularly all the materials native people used and that they're all still here. And I really felt that somebody should document what we have and what we could use them for because you never know, we might need to use them again. So I wrote this little book really um, with that premise in mind. It's on cattails, rushes and grasses because those are the, it's the, that was the area that I felt was very much ignored. Everybody knows about a willow basket, but this is a sort of an area that's a little bit foggy, particularly the rushes and the cattails and the grasses. We don't know much about that. And one of the things that we have in every ditch, practically in every town in Canada, are cattails. So it's not as though it's something that's difficult to find, like special willows or special cedar trees. And uh, that's why I really went into it. My cattails, I think you all know, are the, the flat ones. These are the ones that grow alongside the road. And they grow, um, and they have, and I didn't get one for this, but they, they have the tall spikes, which are called cattails. Um, and these are, these are flat. Now, there's always great confusion about bulrushes and cattails, because everybody calls the things with the hot dog on top a bulrush. And it's a misnomer. If you're actually being correct, it's a cattail. But they all call them bulrushes, um, so you just have to get used to the fact that everybody does. But these, in fact, are cattails. There are two types of cattails. There's some that grow longer and some that grow shorter. And they grow up in the spring. They, can't, they die back every winter. So now they're all starting to die back. And in the spring, they will all come back up again. They have various parts. They're edible. You can eat the tubers. You can eat the pollen on the um, cattails, and you can eat, very early on, you can eat a little piece, it's only here, it's like asparagus, and our native people use them a lot. You can also use the fluff out of the cattail for, they used it for children's diapers, and they also used it for um, flotation things, like life jackets, that fluffy stuff. So, you know, although it's a nuisance if you bring these lovely cattails in the house and they suddenly pop and spread everywhere, the native people did use that, and I think it's an interesting fact that, you know, it, it did have the use at one time in life. Mm -hmm. um, when you use a cattail, you'll find, <laughs> we've probably got one on it, there are different types of leaves. Um, I got this yesterday. I wanted to make sure there was some around if you want to do some more of this, because you should pick them when they're green. I was a bit worried when I walked down the pond to find they were all brown, but I did find some green ones. Um, if you want to do some more when you go home, look around for some green ones because the brown ones are a little bit passé. That's a bit passé now, it doesn't look terribly good. We could probably use it for cordage, but I wouldn't want really to collect those and save them. The ones you really want are these nice green ones, and they're, they're still around. I've got some I can if you want to come and get some. See, these are nice. And you would go and cut those with a knife at the bottom, and then you would dry them, put them I usually put them on something like a tarpaulin and I leave them out in the sun and then I slide the tarpaulin back into the shed and then I slide it out again mm -hmm. because otherwise you don't want them to get rained on, you don't really want them to get dew on. But so if you just have them on a sort of mobile thing you can move them in and out and if it's a hot sunny day and dry they'll dry very very quickly and then of course they'll last forever. And once they're dried you can put them under your bed or in your cupboard or wherever you want to do as long as they're somewhere that's fairly, fairly dry and they will wait for you to use them. Um, so when they're dry, they're crispy, and your well, hand bone may have some crispy ones out there. And then when you want to start to use them, you, you wet them down. 
So you don't soak them, you just get out your hose or your, your watering can and you water them and you wrap them up in a tight towel and they mellow so that they're not actually floating around in the water. They're just in a damp place. And I did these yesterday. <coughs> And so you just do them the day before, or if you want to do them in the afternoon, you could probably just get them out and do them in the morning. Um, once they've been um, damp down and they're easy to use, and you don't use them, you just put them back in the sun and let them dry. So you haven't, you haven't wasted them. If you leave them rolled up for too long, they'll smell like dead flowers. You know, any, 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 you know a leaf in, in the water, how nasty and smelly it goes. Well, if you leave them wrapped up in a wet cloth, they're going to get nasty and smelly. So you can probably keep them overnight in a cool place, but if you want to use them again for a few days, let them breathe and open them up and then wet them down again. Just don't leave them all wrapped up. Otherwise, they'll be, they'll be rather nasty. Um, the, the cattails themselves do come in different um, sorts of kites. The outside of them, I've only got this one, it's rarely held. The outside ones are bigger and longer than the inside ones, if, if this is my stem. The outside ones would be the outside ones. The really nice, most delicate ones are the ones that are on the inside. And you'll find that when you're looking at Not that it really matters, but if you want a really nice little one, you go to the middle and you take a little one out. Um, we don't usually use the ones that have the big hot dogs on the top, because you can't use the hot dogs for anything. So I don't usually pick those, I let them stay. And also, a lot of the energy to plant has gone into the hot dog, and so the leaves are inferior. So if you're in a big patch of cattails, just leave those. Um, I've never been told that it's bad to cut them. I've never, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll talk about rushes in a minute. And rushes are, you shouldn't cut rushes for every, every three years. You shouldn't cut a rush bed. That's people who grow rushes. I don't know about cattails, but I don't think we have to worry. We've got enough in our environment. I don't think we're going to lose our, our cattail. If anybody's right. trying to pull out, Hmm? Cattails. Sorry? If, if you've ever tried to pull out a cattail yes. from a uh, garden pond, the roots are... You know how to do it. Is. Bring in some muskrats. <laughs> <laughs> muskrats eat the roots. Oh, okay. And one spring I was very surprised to see all these cattails floating around in the pond. Well, that's very interesting, you know, cattails floating in the pond. And I asked our local farmer, and I happened to mention it, he said, oh, you've got muskrats in there. And they eat the roots. And it's a very good way of getting rid of them if you want to get rid of them. Bring in some muskrats, but you oh, might have trouble to get rid of them at the end. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, if you see floating cattails in a pond, they've got muskrats. So they cut them already for you. So that's they cut them now, they cut them down, but they, they eat the root. That's basically. Do the beavers they also cut them? Sorry? Do the beavers also cut them? Well, we've never had beavers, so I don't know. Oh. Has anybody had experience with beavers and cattails? No, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know about the beavers. But um, certainly cat muskrats will eat the roots. And it's a, it, their tumours can be eaten in the winter. So, you know, if you're ever stuck out there and you really need to eat something, mm -hmm. don't look for tubers, because they're good. Now, rushes, I haven't put a rush in with me, but I should have done. Rushes are round, they grow, and they have a little flower at the top. And they grow always in water. This might have been a rush at some time. This is a rush flower. So you can always tell the difference between a cattail and a rush. Because a rush has a little flower at the top and it's round. Um, sages have edges and rushes are round. Yes. And this is a round thing. So it's definitely not a cattail, it has no flat leaf. Nearly always grows in water, more difficult to find. We have them growing down here in Lake Dalhousie. Um, some places have lovely, lovely long rushes down in, off the Prince Edward County in the St. Lawrence. They grow as tall as me, they're huge. I used to know somebody who'd collect them in a boat. Um, to collect rushes, you pretty well have to be in your bathing suit. You can paddle around a bit, but for the long ones, you probably need to be in your bathing suit. And you cut them off at the bottom with a knife. But Nancy's got a great system, haven't you? I have this tall, um, handled thing with a foot, and I stand like up and I... Like a glass cutter, like a glass snipper. Yeah, it's, you know, the handle goes like this, and then it goes down, and then it's got a foot. And I stand there in the lake and I cut them off at the bottom and they immediately float up and then I turn them all she the same get way. So wet. We're all oh no, in. I'm standing in the water to do that. I know, we have to oh yeah, you don't have to, I don't have to bend in. That's right. Yes. 
<laughs> now, you, rushes again, like cattails, die back. They come back again every year, so that you don't cut them now. The best time to cut them is when they're at their best, which is probably July, July, August, in the beginning of September. Um, anything that you dry, it's a good thing to cut when it's at its best, because all these materials eventually die back and die, and then they come back. So it's better if you can to cut them when they're beautiful than when they're dying back, but sometimes you'll you get them anyway. Um, so rushes are treated in exactly the same way as cattails. One thing I should mention is that when you go and cut them, ready, this is my bag, my lot, you really want to be careful that you don't do this. <coughs> because if you let them bend when they're fresh like this, and then you wet them down, they very often break when you're using them. And this applies particularly to rushes. So if you're collecting rushes, take a piece of a large piece of plastic or an old um, sheet or a blanket, put it on the side of the river, and collect your rushes and lie them. If you take them out like this, a lot of them will flop down, and then when you start to use them, you'll find there's a weakness here, which is really annoying if you're using the long thing and all of a sudden it's got a weakness. So just remember that try and keep them long. Once they're dry, they won't. For, they won't crack and break, but when they're fresh, they will. So just that's just not the tip, because you never always realise that. But when you start to use them, you realise they've all been, all been bent. So I'm very careful. I treat them rather like babies when they're, mm -hmm. when they're... As soon as they're dry, they're fine, but just keep them on. If you just roll them up in a towel, then they won't flop. It's when people go and hang them over their shoulder and... They will... Anyway, um, rushes are the same as cattails. You dry them and you put them in rushes. All these things will lose their colour in the light. Um, you, anything made with the cattail rush family and the grass family will fade in the sun. They will die very easily. You have no problem dyeing them. So if you want them to stay, you know, want them to be nice and brown, get some old walnut husks or something, um, and you can very easily dye it. The easiest time to dye it is when it's made because not many out of a dye pot that's this long, but if you make something and you can pop it in the dye, it's much easier to put a little basket in the dye pot than lots of long pieces. It will dye and it'll retain its colour, so um, there's not a problem with dyeing this, but it, they won't keep the blue, the lovely green that they've got when you first cut. So we just have to know that. Um, what else should I tell you about them? Anybody got any questions about cutting or gathering? If you're dyeing them, um does it have to be hot, like with wool, to take the colour? It wouldn't matter. I mean, I, I'm usually, you know, we all think it has to be boiled and boiled. It really doesn't. It just needs hot water. Okay. I usually put my, I usually take the hot water out of the tap. Um, uh, walnuts are wonderful. If any of you are looking for brown dye, brown dye is very suitable for this sort of thing. Butternuts, walnuts, hickory nuts. And by the nut, I don't mean the thing in the middle. I mean the thing that's covering the nut. Mm. Um, and you can find those, you can dry them and keep them forever. You can also um, get a brick and hit the nut, hit the walnut like that. You'll get the walnut out and save the husk. I know somebody told me they'd collected a whole lot of walnuts and they were the walnuts they collected. I realised I should always make it clear that it's not the walnut, it's the husk that you want. The outside green part? The outside green part. And the same with the hickories. Oh, oh, the green part is the, the outside the husk. Not the shell on the inside. Not, no, the, the husk of yeah. the, thing, the thing that's got the nut in the middle. Okay, so it isn't the green part. It's green. Yeah. It and is it's green. It's tiny, and then you break that off, and then there's another shell inside. Like, I've got a black walnut. Oh, well, right? that's perfect. Yeah. I know, and I had thousands of them in my garage because of red squirrel. Yes, I bet you did. them. <laughs> I gave them away <laughs> to be eaten. Darn. Anyway. But when they fall off, they, they, yeah. they've got a green yeah. coat, right. and then you open that up, and then there's a nut inside. So That's right. Well, and, and the, and the, the nut is in the middle bit, yeah, right. within the middle bit, but the outside husk is useless. Yes. And the, the, the squirrels and things leave them around. Nobody eats them. We're not yeah. taking anything from anybody. Mm -hmm. um, you can dry them. They'll retain their wet, their colour for years. Um, it won't, they won't lose the colour. When you want to use them, you just put them in a, a pail of water and leave them and the colour will seep out. Um, you can actually get a lot of colour out of walnut husks. So what you want to do is to stick them in a bucket, wet them, 
and then drain off the liquid and keep them. And they'll probably get another batch of colour coming out of them. And then you just, if you want, you can heat that liquid a bit. It doesn't really have to boil, just heat it up. And it's a wonderful, wonderful brown <coughs> dye for almost everything in the world. It'll dye. Well, I was teaching at a school once in Brampton, and it was rather a brand new high school. And we were doing things with nuts. And so we had all these nuts. We were doing natural dyeing, actually. And we crashed them all on the front doorstep. I got in terrible trouble because they stayed the front doorstep. <laughs> Mrs. D, what have you done to our new doorstep? Because, anyway, so be careful where you, you know, we had, a, we had a stick and we crashed them open and then we put the houses away. But of course, we left brown stains on the doorstep. <laughs> Do you need to take the nut out? Um, well, you don't need the nut. And also you want to release the nut from the inside. Otherwise, you won't get that dye. You want to open up the house, really. Okay. I think, and I don't, probably, probably could do it, but I think crash it with, all you have to do is to crash it with a stone or a brick, and it'll open. Wear gloves, otherwise you'll have brown fingers. So, Anchor, if you're saying there's the outer green husk, and then there's the shell, and then there's the nut inside, hmm. are you using the shell as well? No. Okay. The shell will be brown. The when you crash the husk the off, the you'll find the the nut, which is inside the shell, that bit will look quite brown. But the, what you want is the husk, the bit on the outside. You don't want anything to do with the nut, you know, that bit. So, but it's a very easy to dye, and actually it'll dye, you don't <coughs> to dye your sweater or your old trousers or something. Um, it's a wonderful dye because it's so, so um, permanent and it won't fade. Anyway, that's just a little sign. So, if there's anything else we should talk about, I thought the next thing we would do was to quickly look at the slides, and then we'll start. Um, I hope we'll be able to see them. We can just draw the curtains and turn the lights there up. Was a, there was an idea in this book about cattails and dyeing them. It said, um, it was talking about creating a trough, but I was thinking, you know, the big metal bathtubs that are at the dump. If you've got a metal bathtub and you could heat a fire, make a fire under your bathtub, so that, mm. and then put writ dye in and... You know, I well. I'm, the other thing you can do is to that. get um, um, plumbing things, pipes, and you put. You know, plumbers have ways of putting things at the end of them. So you go and buy a plumbing um, pipe. You put something at the end of it. You turn it up so it's in our vertical, and you can put things in there. We use that for willow, and I know somebody who used to um, have a thing rather like a cow trough. A, pig trough, you know, feeding pigs, and they would use that. But, you know, any of these things. I mean, if you just want to soak it, you can just cut a hole in the, make a trough in the um, ground, put in a tarp, put some water in, and stick your cattails in there. You know, because it, it, you're, you're just going to leave them there. So, yeah, all things are possible. You don't actually have, you know, you don't have to have the whole long cattail done. You can... You know, you don't really use the whole long one. It's a little different with willows, but with cattails, it's... So why don't we just take our chairs and we'll...